Korea, 12th of September 2003. Typhoon Maimi, with winds of up to 116 knots or nearly twice Beaufort 12, is the most powerful typhoon to make landfall here since records began nearly a hundred years ago. The typhoon rips ships from their moorings and causes widespread flooding and damage. Some 25,000 people have to be evacuated. In Pusan, South Korea's largest port, giant cargo cranes are toppled. At Hyundai Heavy Industries, the world's largest shipbuilder, an FPSO under construction collides with a new chemical tanker, damaging both. The concrete harbour wall is also damaged by the pounding of the vessels. Costs of repair of these two ships alone is estimated at over 9 million US dollars. Heavy rainfall turns rivers violent. MBC TV that night reports the storm. A 37,000 ton chemical tanker under construction has broken loose from its moorings and started to drift. This large ship was helpless. The uncontrolled vessel collided with many moored vessels and caused considerable damage. The authorities at this moment have not been able to estimate what this is. At Tongyong, across the bay from the Shina shipbuilding yard, the Ali Kudi M had broken loose from its moorings and was blown against a key wall. The following morning, the devastation was clearly visible. We listened to an eyewitness who saw the vessel coming in. It came right at the bridge, right at it. The wind was blowing incredibly. The boat was blown that way and hit the quayside. It was scary, very scary. When such a huge thing comes at you, it scares you badly. The Ali Kudi M is now aground and stuck. Vesmala Salvage with Japanese partner Fukada are awarded the LOF salvage contract and are assisted by KMPRC. Immediate action is the order of the day. Vesmala Salvage Korea instantly mobilizes its salvage team. A salvage master and his team fly in from the Netherlands. A tow master and crew arrive from Singapore. Visual inspection of the damage is first made by the salvage master for his refloat calculations. He has a tentative salvage plan in his mind. Yokohama fenders are placed between dock wall and ship to avoid further damage. Pumps are installed for the coming ballasting operations. The overall salvage plan is decided. It will consist of four separate phases. The first step will consist of preparations for the refloat. These will mainly be removal of mud, stones and debris from around the rudder and propeller and washing away of mud from underneath the ship's hull. The second step will consist of turning the bow 15 to 20 degrees to port to face deeper water. This will only be possible in a good spring tide. To decrease ground reaction and facilitate refloat, the trim will then be altered by ballasting the forepeak and a part of the number one tanks on the port and starboard sides, thus helping lift the stern. The last phase will be the refloat of the Ali Kudi M by three tugs pulling her laterally into deeper water. And all work will be done with safety and the environment in mind. Washing mud from underneath the ship firstly exploited the propeller wash of the tug Suomaru 2 around high water periods. Removing the stones and mud with the grab around the rudder and propeller was a little easier. The shallow depths around the grounding site means operations are carried out at high water, while around low water the tugs have to be disconnected and moved to deeper water, a repetitive and time-consuming task. Casualty inspections are made at low tide with the ship in the dry. Locals feel there is little chance of a successful refloat. The vessel is much too big and stuck much too firmly. As always, the experts sit and watch. 
Night falls on six days of intensive work to complete the first phase. Tomorrow we'll see the first attempt of the second phase. The salvers know that the best tide for the final refloat is only three days away. Early morning, 24th of September. Time to go to work for those who had the luxury of sleep. The salvage crew brings in all the necessary equipment. Through a still quiet city, the crew moves to the casualty. Communication is established and checked with all parties, of vital importance in an operation of this magnitude. High water this morning will be at 7.39 and 2 meters 36 above chart datum. Not really enough, but the salvers will give it a try. Salvage partner KMPRC tugs Dayong 311 and 316 are put on standby with connected tow lines astern. Tug Dayong 306 is connected to the bow. And all tugs are moved to the right position to be ready exactly when necessary. Receiving orders from the towmaster and checking the tide tables, the captain gives the order for 40% power on the bow at 6.45. He slowly increases this to 100%. At 8 o'clock, the attempt is abandoned. The crew is visibly disappointed. Towmaster Foko Ringesma gives his comments. In fact, we have been uh, working on a refloat plan which was based on the spring tide of coming Saturday. So this was the first attempt to see if there was any movement of the ship. But there was 40 centimeters less water than expected this evening. Yeah. That's why we decided to stop now yeah. and uh, give it another try this evening. Because of the shallow waters and debris, Weissmuller salvage career divers have been checking the propellers of the tugboats. There is still plenty of rope and hose around the propellers which must be cleared to allow the tugs to operate. After checking and cleaning, some of the salvage crew take a rest awaiting the evening high tide. This is predicted at 2 meters 76 over datum. Evening, back at the Alikudi M. The salvage master decides to add a second tug on the bow, the Suomaru 2. Present heading 227. The compass is watched carefully for signs of movement. Will she move? 807 is high tide and both tugs give full power. The Dayong 306 is repeatedly frustrated by foul propellers but the Alikudi M does shift two degrees to port, then gets stuck again. At 8.55, the tide starts slackening and the salvers stop the pull. But that two degrees shift is a good sign. At least she's willing to move. Back in the hotel, the salvage team discuss further progress and how to continue the next day. One major problem remains operations in the extremely shallow water which causes difficulties for everyone. So this evening we had a second attempt. There was uh, 30, meter, 30 centimeters more water than this morning. There will be another 20 centimeters more water uh, tomorrow night. Uh, the tide of tomorrow morning won't be used for refloating, but we will use to further prepare the vessel for an next refloating attempt tomorrow evening. So the morning tide is not to be used for another refloat attempt. Further diving surveys are conducted on the casualty and the collapsed tower run over by the Alikudi M on the night of the storm.
careful check is now made of the bow after the two degree shift to port the night before. It is important to know that the movement did not cause a bulldozing or pile-up effect that might have created a wall of debris. Soundings show the bow is clear. The Ali Kudi M should move smoothly over the bottom debris. There was a small sandbag. Yeah? A small sandbag. Where? In the middle there? No, this part. 300 meters astern of the vessel, divers find large parts of reinforced concrete from the red beacon only 1.8 meters below the surface, even at high tide. They will be clearly marked with buoys and, of course, have to be avoided during the tow. But with a ship of this size, it will still be a delicate operation. Nothing will be left to chance. Men will check depths along the full length of the ship. At the quayside, all information is evaluated and discussed among everybody involved. The decision is made to continue on the 25th of September. High tide will give over 2 meters 90 of water and the towmaster gives order to connect three tugs at the bow. As the ship was under construction, she is a so-called dead ship without power and everything on board has to be done manually. At 7.05 in the evening, the start is given for the third attempt and gradually tugs start raising power from 30% slowly to 60%. With marginal clearance in the channel, the towmaster avoids pulling at 100% to prevent another grounding. A close watch is kept on the compass to get any movement. Because the Alicudi M has already moved a couple of degrees the day before, the salvers are confident that the operation should succeed. And yes, at 7.35, more than one hour before high water, the bow slowly shifts another 15 degrees to port. Now the towmaster stops the pull. The Alicudi M has moved to port by about 20 degrees, and the salvers can now initiate the next step in the salvage plan. To secure the now freely floating bow, a pre-laid anchor with sufficient 12-inch rope is connected and tensioned. The heavy mooring line has to be moved manually. The winches are not powered. Controlling the bow is necessary to prevent regrounding caused by the changing tidal currents. Okay. With the casualties bow and anchor now crossing the domestic fairway, port traffic was no longer completely safe. Suspension of traffic was requested and granted for the period of time needed to refloat the vessel. Despite a ruling from local marine traffic police, local boats continue to pass, which lead to some dangerous moments. It takes the salvage team some hours before the anchor is finally rigged at 9.40. After the mooring line is secured, the order is given to release the tugs. The water level is now dropping, and the tugs have to move to deeper water to avoid damage to props and hull. The successful shifting and securing of the bow gives the salvers a good prospect for the continuing refloat operation the following morning. The second phase is now complete. The salvers firstly ballast various tanks with two 400 ton per hour capacity pumps. The operation should not last longer than three to four hours. Step number three in the salvage plan is almost complete. Dutch salvage specialist Piet Kerkhoven explains to a Korean TV crew the art of ballasting. He makes it sound easy, but actually it's not. This pump for uh, ballasting. Yeah. First we only turn the ship. Eh? We turn the ship 20, 15 degrees, after that we ballast to make the propeller come higher and then we turn again aft and then the ship is free.
At 6.30, all tugs are called in to take their positions. At the stern, the Dai Yong 316 and 311, and at the bow, the Dai Yong 306. As planned, immediately upon a pull from the aft tugs, the stern starts to move out. With the bow swinging to starboard again, the forward tugs are instructed to slightly tension their lines. The manoeuvring with the forward and aft tugs gradually clears the casualty from the key into mid-channel. The anchor line proved its value again as it kept the convoy in line as the tidal flow was already running out. Just after releasing the anchor line while moving astern, the green beacon is on the starboard side, only 10 meters clear of the ship's side. This is necessary to keep the vessel away from the remains of the red beacon on the other side. Captain Ringesma directs the tugs, brings the ship into position to move through the narrow passage. It is essential to have the forward tug connected and have the entire convoy in line to clear the marked channel. Careful control and watching all tug movements, the casualty moves slowly but gradually into more open water. Salvage manager Andrew Kim of Weissmuller Salvage Korea maintains contact in Korean with the tugmasters, relaying instructions from the towmaster. The three men in charge from Weissmuller Salvage, confident but still not completely happy. The Alikudi M passes the beacons and makes a sharp turn with her stern to port, sailing into deep water. The decision is made to proceed straight to the jetty of the dockyard. Now, Dockmaster Lee, acting as pilot, takes over and brings the Alikudi M again alongside, 14 days after she was so forcefully swept away. A common practice in salvage work is to congratulate your fellow salvers on a refloat. But in this unique case, those congratulations are only in order once clear of the narrow channel. Okay. Congratulations, eh? Congratulations. Very good. Job well done. <laughs> very well. Good. Very, very nice job. Okay. Towmaster Foko Ringesma and salvage master Case on the Mont give their comments. The difficult uh, situation with this operation was that we were in a location where this vessel never should have been. So as you have noticed, it was very shallow and the water was full of uh, foul water and uh, boys, uh, which caused us a lot of problems with uh, the line handler boats with ropes in the propellers, yeah. our tugs with ropes in the propellers. So that makes this operation a bit unique, yeah. whereby otherwise you connect your tugs and you do your operation. And here it was a swapping of tugs and sending the divers down, clearing the propellers, get the tech back in action. Yeah. Uh, we have to go through that uh, motion three or four times, yeah. but eventually it worked out very well. During this operation was uh, passing uh, through the lighthouse, uh, through the narrow set at the lighthouse. That was the most difficult job for all. The concerning job because uh, we knew something about uh, the broken lighthouse and the depth of the broken lighthouse, but it might always stick at uh, one point which we have missed. So maybe we we're past that. I was very much uh, satisfied. I was very pleased. Job well done. Good cooperation with the Koreans, the Japanese, and the team from Holland. I'm very satisfied. Well, we signed the contract uh, for a re-delivery to the, to the dockyard, and uh, our job is finished. We take off our material and we go home. Going home, as the salvage master says. All equipment is packed up and arranged for the next job. Concern for health, safety, and the environment play a critical role in salvage. Weissmuller staff are regularly trained to the highest professional standards. Now time for signing the certificate of delivery and a little celebration. 
that's always a good uh, habit after every salvage. There's a nice celebration with uh, all the people involved in the operation. Yeah. Not only the salvage team, yeah. but all the dockyard people, the dock uh, personnel, all the uh, people involved. Yeah. Because salvage, you never do alone. Salvage yeah. is teamwork. Yeah. The Global Salvage Masters. We call them Weissmuller Salvage.